بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد The poet says حتى غدا عن طريق الوحي منهزم من الشيطان يقف إثر منهزم كأنهم هربا أبطال أبرهة أو عسكر بالحصى من راحته رمي نبذا به بعد تسبيح ببطنها نبذ المسبح من أحشاء ملتقم So last time we were speaking about when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born and then when he became a Prophet and when the Wahi revelation started to descend Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala changed the system in the heavens and prohibited further the jinns that used to go up and listen to what the angels were saying so then as we were discussing that last time he says so the, the poet was saying how before Rasulullah was born and before he became a prophet the other nations around the world were told by their people that they used to trust their soothsayers and fortune tellers and tellers of the future about the coming of a prophet and how their religion was going to be dominated and it will be ending and so on and so forth so one of the things that they noticed also in that was that the shit the jinn they were unable to go up anymore so now jinn are also responsible creatures of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like human beings are they're supposed to also believe only human and jinn are like that nobody else is like that so when it comes to jinn one of the signs for them of the coming of a prophet was by this major major change in the heavens where their members were unable to go up not that all of them used to go up some of them used to go up so he says and even though their eyes beheld on the horizon great meteors falling as idols toppled on earth so this is what the people on the earth saw happening until sent flying from revelations road demons fled after those who were overthrown so this is about the shayateen what used to happen is that they used to climb one on top of the other all the way up to the heavens i don't know how many they needed to climb up there depends on the size of the jinn because some jinn are smaller than others so i don't know how many they needed but then the topmost one he used to listen pass on the information to the second one second one pass on to the third one and like that it goes all the way down but by that time it would be changed the information a lot of the information would be changed so there'd be half truth and half falsehood near about or you know it could be less for, uh, less truth and more falsehood either way so what happened is although they didn't have free access even before Rasulullah they didn't have complete free access they still used to be pelted but they could still get away with it there were windows of time or opportunity where they could still go and listen so it wasn't like they could just go up there and listen and always know what's going on oh the next meeting is taking place let's go and listen right now it wasn't always like that they had to take their chance even before but after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born then it became strong the the protection became intensified and that's why then they were not allowed to go up there so if they did go there they were actually shot at so they probably left doing that what used to happen is they used to go up the first one would be pelted so he would have to jump down and then the second one would be pelted so allah knows best exactly how this used to happen there's a hadith in which once the prophet ﷺ asked his companions they'd just seen a shooting star they'd just seen one so he asked his companions what did you guys used to say about that in jahiliya times what was your theory about a shooting star so they said oh we used to think that an angel has been born or a, an angel has just died. You know, they used to call the angels the daughters of Allah. So we used to think that it's something to do with angels up there. So the Prophet said, that's not the matter. That's not, that's not what it used to be. Right. Then, in the next two poems, which are the last two poems of this section about the birth, he just describes how the shaitan's were the shayateen were when they were being pelted so he says كأنهم هربا أبطال أبرهة أو عسكر بالحصى من راحته رمي نبذ نبذم به بعد تسبيح ببطنهما 
نبض المسبح من أحشاء ملتقم. So he says that these demons they fled after those who were overthrown, fleeing like the champions of Abraha, and or like a host pelted with pebbles from his hand. The author, the poet, is talking about two things here. There were two events that took place in history where, well, one took place beforehand, one took place actually after. One took place before the Prophet Wasallam, the other one took place after his birth, of course. One is the Abraha story, the king of Yemen, who wanted to come and topple the Kaaba, and how they were attacked and they all fled. So he's using that as an example to show how these jinn were fleeing from the heavens when they were shot at. So because Abraha's army, it was being shot at with pebbles as well. And they were just scattering left, right, left, right and center and just dying from that. So he's trying to say that they, f they had to flee the way Abraha had to, had to flee with his army. Or like a host pelted with pebbles from his hand. In the battle of <coughs> Badr, the Prophet wasallam took some pebbles and he threw it in the direction of the Quraysh, of the people who had come to fight him. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used that to topple them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he toppled them using, using the pebbles. So these were two major defeats where people had to flee, where people had to flee. So likewise, he's saying that although you could not see the jinn fleeing from the heavens, it was in a similar manner. So he says, fleeing, ka'annahum haraban, as though they are fleeing, running away. Abtalu abrahatin. Abtal means bat, batal. Batal means a champion, pehelwan, they say in Urdu. Right? So they're like the champions of Abraha, they had to flee, or like a host, mean, meaning a group, or askarun, an army, an army that were pelted with pebbles, bilhasa min rahatehi rumi, which were thrown from his hand, which were thrown from the Prophet's palms. Nabdambihi, we will do that part next. But here, what first and foremost, he is depicting the running away and the fleeing of the jinn when they were being pelted by the shooting stars up in the heavens as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. So first is Abraha's story. Now what exactly happened with Abraha, many of you probably know the story anyway. But the other story, which will uh, quickly have a, a synopsis of this story, but the second story is that the people of Badr, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa threw stones at them, pebbles. Uh, people of Badr and also he did that in uh, the Battle of Hunayn. We're not going to be speaking about the Battle of Hunayn today because the poem, poet himself will allude to the Battle of Hunayn specifically later on. So we'll look at it then. So you can resemble, uh, you, you, can, you can consider the, the, the shayateen that are fleeing like any of these stories. The main thing is that they're all being shot at in a divine way and they've had to run away. So Abraha, who was the leader of Yemen, what he did was he wanted, he saw that people in Makkah were, Makkah was well respected. People held it in high esteem. People considered it a sanctuary. So he thought that if I build a special place of worship, then we will have the same kind of respect and reverence. Because he felt that the reverence for Makkah came with the house of Allah, which it did, of course. He felt that if he made a house like that and had people start coming around it and performing these rites, then he would also... So he was a man of ambition. Clearly, he was a man of ambition. What this teaches us that men of ambition, they're the ones who would put a foot in this kind of direction. They look at competition. Humans are very competitive. So they're looking at this as a competition. Now this is talking about the time of Jahiliyyah, the year the Prophet ﷺ was born. So this is before Islam. So the idols who were being worshipped there, they were, being, they were idols, 360 idols. So he felt, I could put a few idols here and we'll have the same thing. But that was a tradition that although they were worshipping idols, the origin there was the house of Allah, built by Ibrahim ﷺ. So he had a religious origin, though it had taken a pagan cover and a form at this point in time. But what people with ambition need to think is that yes, competition is very good and humans, they learn from other humans. Uh, there are ideas that you get where you put two, three, four things together and then you come up with a new unique idea. Generally, most of it is based on some kind of model 
at some level and then you manipulate that or you change that and you think about that and you have uh, some kind of stroke of uh, genius or luck from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course however one has to be careful that that doesn't lead them to do the wrong that does not lead them to desecrate the honorable the sanctified that is also done in a matter of honor then you can succeed so he decided to build a Kaaba of his own a house of his own a place of worship one of the desert Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula from near Mecca he decided that this is sacrilegious this is something totally wrong so he went down to Yemen went into this place of worship and defecated and soiled the area where nobody was around that was his simple way of showing his anger and protest that was the protest of the time to do that now Abraha became extremely offended to such a degree he felt that now there is no response to this except to go and put this house down so that this house will remain supreme so it's now his ambition and his goal is mixed with anger with wrath and once a person loses his mind then he doesn't think clearly then that sometimes leads to their destruction became extremely angry got his entire force together and within his force he got his elephants together they were the unique feature of his force the people up north in uh, the Hijaz had not seen these elephants so they didn't know how, what to deal how to deal with them so he got this force together of course they had their lookouts they knew that he was coming along even though there's no means of mass communication in those days so the people of Makkah what they did was they decided look we have nothing we, we can't argue with this army that's coming they ran to the surrounding mountains around Makkah Makkah is surrounded by mountains it's been surrounded by mountains for all its history but now those mountains one by one are coming down the landscape is changing down there now there's buildings which are the mountains tall skyscrapers monolithic structures big massive ones so they decided that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is they had such firm belief they knew they were in a very sacred place and they knew this is the house of God so they said only God can look after this now let's move out of the way so they all went up into the mountains when he got to Quraysh when he got to Makkah th there's a there's a long story about this but Abu Abdul Muttalib the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he kind of came on the way because what happened is as this Abraha's army is going on the way he's also taking and confiscating or killing or whatever the flocks that people were grazing around so he did that to Abdul Muttalib's so Abdul Muttalib he came right in front of him and confronted him he said why are you doing that for so Abraha actually admired the courage of this of Abdul Muttalib uh, Abdul Muttalib was like quite taken aback but then he asked him a question. He says that, why have you come to defend your flock and not the house of God, not your house of God? So Abdul Muttalib gave a very interesting answer. He said that I'm in charge of my flock, so I have to come and argue about it. The house, lahu rabbun yahmihi. It has a Lord that will protect it. That did strike Abraha. So then he gave his animals back. But they went into the ravines and into the, uh, into the mountains and so on. And just left the city to, to uh, left the city to be taken over. Literally, that's what they did. They left it to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Anyway, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. There's a long story, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala showed His great power and His might. So, where nobody could fight against these elef elephants, the elephants they came to a particular position and they refused to go forward. You would turn it in that direction. It would just refuse to go. It sit down. It won't do anything. So Abra obviously became a bit frightened because they believed in a lot of superstition that there's something wrong here. But no, his anger was too much. He wanted to go. And they, they tried to push him with all sorts of things, the elephants and so on. But it wasn't going to work. Finally, they were attacked. They were attacked and they just had to all just run away and flee. But then they were attacked by the Ababil. Meaning they were attacked by the Ababil. These are small birds. And they had three stones each, one in each paw in, its, in each of its claw and one in its beak and it would just drop it it would just drop it and it would just penetrate each of these people in the army and although Abraha wasn't at, what, didn't die there he died on his way back just disintegrating so when these stones would hit somebody 
they would literally just start eating away at the flesh. It was like some kind of toxic pellets of some sort, specially configured to do this. So Abraha became totally, literally like pieces, because just parts of his body falling off, flesh falling off, until eventually he just totally died. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept his house. Despite the fact that his idol was being worshipped there, the origin was the house of Allah. The, that was the year Rasulullah sallallahu was going to be born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had many things in store for it. Then, so that, that's the short story, the long story you can go on. You know, there's many other sources for that. But we want to move on. Now he says that about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa from his blessed hands throwing these pebbles in the direction of the enemy in both of those occasions of Badr and Hunayn. Now, it says here in the next poem, نَبْذَمْ بِهِ بَعْدَ تَسْبِيحٍ بِبَطْنِهِمَا نَبْذَ الْمُسَبِّهِ مِنْ أَحْشَاءِ مُلْتَقِيمِ So in the previous one that we read, he is saying that when you want to think of these, uh, the, these jinn, how they're running away, these shaitans, how they run away when they're pelted and they can't listen to the angels speaking. And he said that you can think about this in the way Abraha's force had to run away and they were defeated or like the Prophet Sallallahu threw the pebbles and those forces were defeated. As you can see, he's kind of stringing all of this together from one point to the next, one point to the next. He's not mentioning them disjointly. He's talking about all the miracles of the birth. Within that, the miracle was of the shaitans being pelted. Now the shaitans are being pelted like these enemies who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi who like Abraha and like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pelted. And then he says, it brings in one of the specialities of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi He says, they sang glory in his hand. These pebbles sang glory. Basically, they did tasbih in his hand. These pebbles did tasbih in his hands and they were cast like the praising Yunus. And then they were cast like the praising Yunus alayhi salam, cast from the whale's belly. So he is referring to two other totally two other situations that have no connection with this but they have relevance to it so he's talking about the way he started talking about the way the army had to retreat in Badr and in Hunayn and then he says the Prophet Sallallahu that was because the Prophet threw the pebbles at them now at that time when he threw the pebbles at them those pebbles did not do tasbih but there were other times, two other times, well, one other time when they did do tasbih in his hand. So then he connects it with that. So he's saying pebbles which did tasbih at one time. Not at the time then he threw it, but before that time in another instance, which I'll be covering. And there was also another time when something else was thrown. So because the theme is now about throwing, there's Yunus alayhi salam who was thrown because he made tasbih. So the connection between the stones being thrown by Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam which stones had made tasbih at one time in his hand. Yunus salam made tasbih in the stomach of this whale and he was then thrown out to, to security back to normal life. So that's the way he's kind of um, winding this up all together as this beautiful poem. If only, you know, you could under, it's just that the next time you will read this poem because you know the stories that it refers to when you read the poem, it'll just all flash by. That's why the ulama have found this to be one of the most profound poems because it incorporates so many different incidents and stories and that nearly like so many historical facts and the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So when you just read or listen to two lines of this poem, it reminds you of so much because it's not just talking about one thing, it's talking about many, many things. That's the benefit of the commentary to know the commentary when you read the poem. And it also gives us, uh, mashallah, uh, more inspiration uh, as, as, as believers. He gives us more inspiration as well. So he says, Nabdam bihi, throwing it like, pelting it like, ba'da tasbihin bi batnihima, after they had made tasbih in his hand at one time. Nabdal musabbih. What's a musabbih? Musabbih, musabbih is the one who does tasbih, right? So, like the casting of the one who did tasbih, referring to Yunus alayhi salam, min ahsha'i multaqimi, ahsha intestines. 
coming out from the intestines of a, of a whale. Right, so what this is now in detail, Imam Abu Dawood and Tabarani, they both relate from Anas radiallahu anhu, that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a handful of pebbles from the ground and they began to do tasbih in his hand until the tasbih was heard by people. So it wasn't just they were doing tasbih to Rasulullah, they could be heard. And then Abu Bakr and took the pebbles. They continued to do tasbih in his hand as well. And then when we took the pebbles, they, they, they stopped doing tasbih. So we didn't experience it in our own hands, but we heard it from there. There is another narration that says that he did it in the hands of Umar, Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhu as well. But that's another narration. When it comes to Yunus alayhi salam's story, many of us have heard parts and parcel of it. And in general, we understand what the story is. But it's a very interesting story that the gist of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, the main features of it. Because the Quran is not a book of detailed history to tell you stories, bedtime stories at night. It is more for reflections. So the main themes of each story that are relevant and that are more historical in their application uh, and, and can apply forever, they are generally mentioned. It's hadith and other, uh, it's hadith that fill the gaps. So you had an individual whose name was Yunus ibn Matta, one of the Bani Israel prophets to a certain group of the Bani Israel. Apparently he was given prophecy at the age of 28 years of age, according to this narration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to, to this group. He invited them to, to the way of Allah. They didn't respond. He did this for a very, very long time. And eventually when he became totally frustrated and then despondent, and felt that they were not going to now listen. He decided to use his one dua that each prophet is given that is definitely answered. And he said, oh Allah, finish them off. He became despondent of them. He said, finish them off. Now, this was a very unique case. They thought to them, now they had a bit of fear from him. Meaning, they rejected him. But then he was speaking about something quite unique. So they felt that maybe he might have something, but to change your ways is not easy. To give up what your forefathers have been doing is not easy for anybody, believe me. These Sahaba, you don't understand what they went through. If you just understand how difficult it is for people who were so more set in their ways than us. We live in a, especially when you live in a cosmopolitan, like we are probably, if you live in London, you're probably less set in your ways and have more flexibility. Wallahu alam. This is just the theory that comes to mind than somebody in a place like Blackburn or Bolton. Even though we're both in England. Because there's a lot more culture and tradition there. Communities are much stronger and closer. When you come to London or any cosmopolitan society, you've got different challenges every day. There's different things that inspire you, encourage you, tempt you, attract you, mislead you. And you you constantly have to adapt yourself and fight sometimes in the sense a spiritual kind of uh, battle with these things and subhanallah there's a there's a lot of these challenges so now we're talking about a people who are very set in their ways the hundreds of years they've been doing they've been doing this and they were scrutinized by by the society who cares today who does what today you know, you can be what you, what you become. Somebody, few people may say something, but you're not going to become an outcast. You still will have your scope. There you became an outcast. Anyway, so for them to change and to become believers with a small band of people, that was no doubt one of the, the, the reasons for their great position. So now what these people thought is that he's saying this, let's watch. Now. So he told them, look, when he made the dua against them, he was told... Or it's mentioned that it, sorry, it was told to him that the punishment is going to come on this day. So he was informed, divine information, revelation, however you want to call it. So he mentioned that, look, this is what's going to happen. So now they began to speak with one another. And they said that, look, we're going to find out if this man is a true man or not. Let's watch what he does. Right? Let's watch what he does. If he stays here, it means there's nothing's happening. If he runs away and, and leaves the area, that means something's going to happen. Then we need to really think about it. So we know if he's a liar or not. Because many people could claim these things and say punishment's coming on this day. And they're just relaxing in their house. That means he's a liar. Otherwise, if he runs away, then that means he's got something going. So when that day came, the night of that day, middle of the night, he left the area. 
he went out of the city. And they were watching out for this because they were concerned, it seemed. They had enough concern because then they realized that the punishment is definitely going to come. Then they realized that he must be truthful. So the truth got to their hearts. So they all also went out and they started making dua. They sep they, it says that they separated the young animals, the, the, the feedlings, those the, the, the young cam uh, camels and goats, etc. that were feeding from the, their mothers. They separated them so that they would cause a big uproar as well just to attract mercy. Right? Because you know, these little kids are crying and, uh, for their mothers. So they did all of these things and they made lots of toba and they probably had enough da'wah from him to understand what was required. So they did that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped the punishment from them. Now Yunus salam doesn't know this, he's gone. Without looking back, he's gone. Then he waited at a particular place, waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what he said he would do and the punishment to come. But then he noticed that nothing major was happening. He couldn't see anything happening. So he was at a distance where he could still see. And he noticed that no punishment had come. And of course, you can imagine what he felt like. How am I going to go back? Because they're going to think I'm a liar. And apparently, the idea was in their tradition, if anybody was caught out to be a big liar like that, they would be killed. So of course, he'd done what he did out of anger for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his sake. He decided he's never going to go back to that community. He's going to go somewhere else. However, he didn't ask Allah what to do. He just decided to take apparently the matter in his own hand, thinking the next best thing to do is just go from this area, run away. I can't go back there. He could have asked Allah subhanahu wa should I go back there? But that would have been a lot to have asked, you know, to think of, to ask. Wallahu alam. Now, although he never did, he didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't told that you go outside and just wait for me to tell you what to do. You know, it was like, you need to go. So he had gone. But when it comes to people who are close to someone, they will be then taken to task for every small slip, which for others would be tolerated. But for those who are closer, they're supposed to know better. So this was the suboptimal thing he did. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a sin that he committed because there's nothing haram he did. He did everything according to protocol. But now he must have been, he should have thought, no, let me ask Allah this time as well what I should do, even though it goes against everything that I think is going to happen to me there where they're going to kill me. So that, that was the kind of confusion that was there. Because small defects are considered to be, uh, in those who are considered to be honorable, small defects among them do, uh, uh, look glaring. Whereas anybody else who does weird things like that, even bigger things, it doesn't look bad among them because they use, they, their whole makeup is like that. When somebody honorable does something even uh, slightly weird, it looks more weird than it looks on somebody else. He ran towards the sea. He ran towards the sea. That was the, the, the close area for him to get across because to put, to put some water in between him and his area. That was the best way for him to do. He entered into the ship that was leaving, this boat, this uh, sea uh, means of conveyance. He went, it's related from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu that now he's on this boat or ship and they got into the middle of the ocean and this ship will not move. It suddenly stopped. It wouldn't go anywhere. It would go in the wrong direction. It wouldn't go the direction they wanted. So now they were very superstitious people at the time, of course. So they decided something's wrong here. One of us, they, they figured out that there's one of us is a runaway slave. You know, you had runaway slaves at that time, people who were owned by somebody, they ran away. So this was, I don't know, a tradition of the time that this, the, the boat, something bad happened when there was a runaway slave. It was ba too bad. Who is that? Let's figure it out. Nobody, he didn't think he was a runaway slave because he wasn't a slave of any human being. So they decided to pick lots and they had a strange way of doing that. They would gather all of their arrows together and shoot them. And if one arrow did not act like the other arrows, they did it a few times and each time it was his arrow that went astray and kind of signaled out that it was him. So they did about three times. Each time it was his arrow that stood out. So they decided that he's going to have to throw himself into the water. What do you call that? When they put people overboard, they walk the plank, as they call it. Right. Now the thing is that he's, they're trying to find the best spot to throw him into the water. 
So according to one narration it mentions, in fact he says that he was going to throw himself into it. That he, he decided that there's no way this boat is going to go anymore and I'm going to have to walk the plank, I'm just going to have to go. And tawakkalna ala Allah. So each time they would go to one corner of the ship to do that, there'd be this whale waiting there, open jaw. So then he goes to another area. Let me go there, at least I don't fall into the whale. <laughs> right? So it just used to go around. He realized then that this is from Allah. Something is strange. This is from Allah. So he throws himself in. He submitted himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, the prophets will have a bit more understanding, a lot more understanding than us of what's going on and the subtle signs. They know Allah more than any of us. So instead of drowning, he was picked up by this whale and swallowed alive. There is another narration that he actually fell into the water first, then he was swallowed. The other opinion is that he literally, as he went in, the whale just took him up straight away without touching the water. Now what you have to understand is that although this whale has a system by which it works, anything that goes into anybody's stomach, we know that it's not going to, you know, if it's, especially if it's malleable, it's, it's not going to come out proper. It's going to come out in a different form, all processed and everything. It's a, the, we cannot stop our system. The only thing we can do is try to puke it out or excrete it out. But there's no way we can stop our system and say, don't attack what's in there. Unless it's something like metal or something like that, which will attack us. So now, what are you going to do with a human being, this massive whale? Its system isn't going to stop. But what you have to realize is that the headquarters that controls this, this whale is not within the whale. The headquarters is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who governs every aspect of every whale, not just that whale, but every whale and every movement it makes, whether that movement is a volitional movement of the whale itself or within its system and the way its system functions. It asks Allah because that is what we believe, that Allah is behind everything He permits each of these things without it tiring Him out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's related that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told, uh, told the whale that this one is not food for you. This is not sustenance for you. Lam aj'al Yunus laka rizqan. I haven't made Yunus rizq and your sustenance. Wa indama ja'al tu batnaka lahu hirzan wa sijnan. I've only made your stomach for him two things. A prison for him to learn a bit of a lesson. And number two, protection for a while. فَكَانَ مِنَ الْمُدْحَضِينَ As Allah says in the Quran, فَكَانَ مِنَ الْمُدْحَضِينَ Mudhadin means the one who was overcome and dominated. He was overcome and dominated when they picked lots to find out who it was that was causing the ship to not function properly. So it was him. Or it could also mean, and then it says, وَهُوَ mulim. Mulim means he's the one who was censored. Censored means told off, admonished. That's exactly what was happening here. After that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had the whale throw him out. Allah protected him. And within the, 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 the whale did not harm him in any significant way to make him lose it. How he breathed during that time, Allah knows best. If Allah can allow an embryo to breathe for nine, you know, five months or whenever it gets life and for, to breathe and to sustain itself in that, how difficult is it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that later? You know, for an embryo that doesn't even have its own ability, it, Allah has given it enough ability, spontaneous ability to do it without doing it itself. So yeah, you've got a human being, Allah knows best how that happens. How long did he stay in there? Allah knows best, but it says that this was just a, like an hour of the day, according to one opinion, very quickly. Some say about seven hours of the day, some say three days. So it was either days or hours. Allah knows best. Either way, it definitely happened as Allah says in the Quran. Some say even 40 days. Now, the question though here that's important for all of us, what do we do if we're swallowed by a whale? I don't know if any more miracles are going to happen like that. Of course, they're possible. But forget the whale. There's not much likelihood that we're going to be captured by a whale unless we're, with the, you know, we're playing with the orcas all the time. But it's not about the whale here. It's about any other whales in this world. Getting stuck in a rut. Having something overcome you. That's the lesson of this story for us. It's an amazing story for this prophet, a miracle. 
but that's a prophet and a miracle. But for us is, at our level, if we get stuck in the middle of a whale, stuck in a shackle by something, what's going to help us? What helped this prophet? What helped him was his tasbih. That is what this poet also alludes to. That's what Alam Abu Si rahimahullah alludes to. So, there's a difference of opinion as to exactly how that was. Ibn Jubayr, he says, it was him saying, Subhanallah. Very powerful. Subhanallah. We say it many times a day. Subhana Rabbi al azim Subhana Rabbi al ala Unfortunately, the, I would say maybe a majority of the people that say it don't know what it means. Which is the weirdest thing, weirdest phenomenon that you can think about. If, when you, it's so silly. You got more than 50% of the Muslim world who probably say Subhana Rabbi al azim Subhan Rabbi al A'la in Arabic, but they probably don't know what it means. Because why, why I say 50% is because Arab speaking Muslims are a minority of the world. There are more non Arab speaking, non Arabic speaking Muslims in the world. And not all of them, unfortunately, know what Subhan Rabbi al Azim means or Subhan Rabbi al A'la means. So they can't, when they say Subhan Rabbi al A'la, they don't know what they're saying. So what kind of a tasbih is that? The whole point of it is not to say a few words, but it's to say, what is meant by the, those words to make you feel that when you're in your ruku, you're saying glorified, purified, absolutely pure and transcendent is my Lord who is most majestic. That's what we say in ruku. We bow down and we, we speak about the majestic Lord. We say he is blemishless. That's what it means. And when we're in sajda, subhanahu rabbi al-a'la. We're in sajda, we're low down, we're on the ground. And we say glorified is our Lord who is most high so it's this ajeeb system where you're on the ground and you're talking about your most high lord that's a true tasbih when you understand what that means then you won't rush to come out of the tasbih <coughs> out of the sajda now what else others have a different opinion for example qatada a tabi'i and ibn abbas they say it was his salat and his prayer during good times that benefited him during his difficult times. Because anybody who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in good times, easy times, when there's no problems, it benefits him in times of difficulty. And there is no doubt about that. Everybody has difficulty in this world, but those who are pious and righteous, who have some tasbih, they have more energy to deal with that difficulty of the world. Dahaq ibn Qais, another one of the tabi'een, who was a famous mufassir of the Qur'an, he used to say, on the mimbar, this was his, uh, this was his khutbah in a sense, he would say, اُذْكُرُ اللَّهَ فِي الرَّخَى يَذْكُرْكُمْ فِي الشِّدَّةِ Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your times of prosperity, and Allah will remember you in your time of difficulty. Because, in the Yunus alayhi salam, كَانَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ ذَاكِرًا Yunus alayhi salam was considered to be a person who remembered Allah. So in Allah's sight, he was a person who remembered Allah. So when this difficulty came upon him, it benefited him. Because Allah says, Allah says it clearly in the Quran. If it wasn't for the fact that he was of the musabbihin, of those who do tasbih, then he could have stayed. He would have stayed in the stomach of that fish until the day of resurrection. He would never have come out. Clearly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that your tasbih counts. His tasbih helped him. It worked him. And that is the main gist of this story for us. That in the, when we get caught up in a whale in this world, our tasbih should help. But that tasbih should be profuse during the day in our good times. So you have, now look at this. You have Yunus alayhi salam in the fish. He's done tasbih beforehand, so it helps him now in this time of difficulty. On the totally diametrically opposing end, you have Fir'aun, who is a massive transgressor, a tyrant during his good times, when he's enjoying his rule and leadership and his power. So when he is about to drown now, in a similar situation, he's about to drown, it's in the water. He brings, he, he says, Amantu. I believe now. Something convinced him at that time to say, I believe, but it was too late. Because he had nothing going for him. 
he had nothing going for him. So nothing could benefit him. It was too late. It was just said too late. So, Fadhkurullah fi raha yadhkurkum fi shiddah. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in pros prosperous times, He'll remember you in difficult times. Hassan ibn Abil Hassan says that this is another opinion that he actually then carried on doing tasbih in the stomach of the fish as well. It's rated that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when Yunus alayhi salam called out fi dhulumat in the darkness, his calling, his dua went up to the heavens. Because our duas, the reason we point up is because that's the qibla of dua. Not because Allah is in the heavens, in the physical heavens. You can't say that. Otherwise, the question is then we pray towards the Kaaba, which is called the house of Allah. Allah is not in there. It's a direction for conformity because humans need direction psychologically. Anyway, when this prayer went up to the heavens, the angel said, Ya Rabbana, Hada sawtun da'if min mawdi il ghurba. This sounds to be Yunus's voice, but it's very weak. It sounds very weak. Like it's, I can hear a signal, but it's very weak from the, you know, they're still looking for that plane that went down, bichara, you know, those Malaysian, that Malaysian Chinese plane. So it's coming from a very strange place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his call. Ibn Jubayr, he says that where he mentions that if he had not been from the people who did tasbih, what tasbih are we speaking about? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al There is no God except you, subhanak. Again, tasbih, subhanak is another way of saying subhanallah. Subhanaka just means you are glorified. I have been of the oppressors. It mentions that then the, this whale, it went around the oceans until it finally threw him out in Mosul. Mosul is in the media right now, isn't it? Yeah. Mosul is in North Iraq. He was فَنَبَذَهُ فِي الْعَرَاءِ وَهُوَ سَقِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he was then thrown out into an ara. An ara means a land that's without any trees. He was thrown out like a, like a child is thrown with some there was some effect on his body of being in the ocean uh, of being in the uh, in the whale it's like an embryo is thrown out so he had to be brought back to he had to be rehabilitated rehabilitated so his flesh was all um, very sensitive and so on except that he was still sound in terms of bodily functions and so on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, brought for him, uh, facilitated for him rather, this kind of uh, yaqteen. Yaqteen is like a pumpkin, something of that family, the squash family. So that's what he used to eat in the day and night. Shajaratan, or is it wa'ambatnahu? Shajaratan min yaqteen, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. So he used to eat from it and he used to. It, it, there's narrations which mention that he used to find all forms of taste from that and he used to enjoy it. Eventually he became fine, rehabilitated, became better. One day he was sleeping and when he woke up, this gourd or what he used to eat from, that became all dried out due to the intense heat of the sun. And he felt that, okay, now what's my way of survival here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed to him, O oh Yunus, are you worried about this plant becoming dry and you're not perturbed by the destruction of a hundred thousand people, your people? More than, it was to alfin aw yazidun. It was, that's what Allah mentioned in the Quran, it was a hundred thousand or more people who have made tawbah after you left them. So now he realizes the story that they made tawbah after he left them. So this was all a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can say a slap on the wrist. He made him go through this, gave him this miraculous thing. Right? He becomes known. I mean, who else went into a fish and came out alive? So it's a miracle. It's a punishment. It's an admonition at, in, on one side. But at the same time, it also makes him to be known. We know Yunus alayhi salam 
we, we, we speak about him more than we, we speak about other prophets because he's got a strange story. Kids are told his story before many other prophets. So then he becomes well known as well as Allah works in ajeeb ways. So this is the fact that anybody who's at that stage, they are required to have more adab, etiquette, refined understanding and behavior than anybody else. That is where he went slightly wrong in just that. Nothing haram, nothing wrong, nothing blasphemous. Just that adab was just slightly in the wrong direction. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to our Prophet, and this applies to all of us in any situation, especially for those who are trying to work hard and do something, and they're finding opposition. Allah says to the Prophet, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكْ فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكْ Be patient and persevere on the command of your Lord. وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ don't be like the, 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 the don't be like the one of the whale. Don't be like the whale one. Don't rush. Don't jump to conclusions and just run out and leave and abandon. Work, persevere. Of course, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had him go back to his people. And then he went and they, of course, they welcomed him. And he, they, they brought faith on him then. Uh, and... Uh, he stayed with them until he and they all uh, passed away. Right. There's two more lines. After this he says, جَاءَتْ لِدَعْوَتِهِ الْأَشْجَارُ سَاجِدَةً تَمْشِي إِلَيْهِ عَلَى سَاقٍ بِلَا قَدَمِ Now this is where he starts the next, next section. The next section is the section of the Prophet's miracles. So he says, جَاءَتْ لِدَعْوَتِهِ الْأَشْجَارُ سَاجِدَةً تَمْشِي إِلَيْهِ عَلَى سَاقٍ بِلَا قَدَمِ Trees came prostrate to heed his call. Their trunks walking to him though they had no feet. Now, already to say trees walking to him, which would obviously mean sliding towards him in some sense. But just to make it sound even more, nobody can walk without feet. So this is just to show more exaggeration. And of course, they just were tearing the ground and coming in his direction. And then they would go back and it would all become fine again. Like something you'd see in a movie today. One of these weird sci-fi movies. Because camera effects. But this was reality. Only for a short amount of time. It didn't happen all the time. كَأَنَّمَا سَطَرَتْ سَطْرًا لِمَا كَتَبَتْ فُرُوعُهَا مِنْ بَدِيءِ الْخَطِّ فِي اللَّقَمِ What does that mean? It was as though their branches were writing lines as they came along with the finest calligraphy. Just to show the beauty of the way they're coming. This is a poem. This is to read into things and to make them sound and impress and inspire. Okay, so very quickly, what he's saying here is we just spoke about the pebble speaking in his hand, making tasbih. And then, and then on the occasions of Badr and Hunayn, the enemy being defeated by his throwing the pebbles in their face. After that, he speaks about the mu'jiza of the trees prostrating for the Prophet ﷺ. And they're responding to his call and his beck. Now, whether any tree actually prostrated in front of him or not, we don't know that. But what it means by prostration here is submission. Because the highest level of submission to Allah is through prostration. So that's a word he's used to explain them coming to him, which is more than any prostration anybody can do. It's a, it's a miracle like that. However, although you don't have any narrations about trees prostrating to him, you do have stories of camels and sheep prostrating to him, coming down and just putting their heads down in front of him. Related from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once entered into an orchard and a camel came up and prostrated in front of him. It's related from Jabir, Ya'ala ibn Murrah, Abdullah ibn Ja'far, that there was this one orchard that nobody would enter because there was a, a camel who had become wild in there. When camels become wild, you can't trust them anymore. They become very stubborn. A camel is very arrogant, very stubborn animal when it becomes stubborn. Otherwise, it's, very, it's fine if you're fine with it. So, in this one, anybody that came in, it would attack it. It would attack that, that person that came in. So the Prophet ﷺ walked in. When the Prophet ﷺ walked in, it didn't come to attack him. He invited, he called it. So it came and lay down as a docile form 
next to, in front of him. And the Prophet ﷺ said to it, nothing in between the hand, there's nothing in between the heavens and the earth that doesn't know that I am the messenger of Allah except the disobedient jinn and humans. The only two creatures that are disobedient and don't recognize me are from the humans and the jinn. In another version of the narration, he says, the Prophet asked him that, why are you doing this for? So he says that, oh, they, I think they're going to uh, slaughter me. So he's just acting as for survival. Anas reports that once Rasulullah went into this Ansari's garden with Abu Bakr Umar and another Ansari, and there were some sheep there. They made sajda. Abu Bakr anhu then said, he looked at those sheep. And for them, they were always thinking how we can worship Allah more and how we can respect our messenger more. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when he saw that, Abu Bakr anhu says that, نَحْنُ أَحْقُ بِالسُّجُودِ مِنْهَا We've got more right to prostrate in front of you than a sheep. If you're allowing the sheep to do that, Ya Rasulullah. Now, when it comes to trees, we know that when he called it, it came and it spoke. So there's a hadith sahih from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that he called a tree and it came to him in this, you can tell it's in submission until he came and stood right in front of him. And it said that he is the messenger. And then the Prophet sallallahu told it to go back and it went back. Ajeeb situation, there was nobody who had a camera at that time. If people can do magic today, right, that is not a magical trick. Like this new guy that's on the block. Walking on water. Okay, that one, they could have something underneath. He went down to the water and just started walking on it. And everybody's watching him. But then some part of his feet are getting wet and that. So you wonder that. And when he's walking very carefully, why does he have to do that? The only way he could have to do that is there's something underneath or he's holding on to a gin or something. And then doing these weird other things which don't seem like magic tricks. They feel that he definitely has a jinn to his, because it doesn't even seem like magic. It seems like this, he's got help to pick up weight that the strongest guy there just about managed to pick up and he's like half his size and he picks up that weight with no problem. Right, so there's something going on there. So if that can happen today for some random guy doing magic, or doing these weird things than a prophet doing these things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these amazing ways to split the moon and so on big things like that so it's related from Aisha radiallahu anha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that you know one of the first meetings with Jibreel alayhi salam one of the first instances of wahi and revelation when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi came back on his way, that was the time this happened. So this was before he became famous and so on. One of the first times he, got, he came back from Jibreel Ali that must have been an amazing encounter. He says that every tree I went past, every stone I went by, it said to me, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. This didn't happen all the time. This happened in that instance when he had first met with Jibreel Ali and came back uh, on one of those first instances. Umar radiallahu anhu relates, this is related by Qadi Iyad in his shifa from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. He says that once we were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on a journey, and this Arabi desert Arab came close by, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said to him, Oh desert Arab, oh Bedouin, where are you going? He says, I'm going back, to, back home. He says, would you like to learn some virtue and goodness? Would you like to learn something good and nice? What is it? He says that you believe... Prophet said, you believe that there's no God except Allah alone. He has no partner and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is servant and his messenger. So the Arabi, he said, bring me some proof. Who's, gonna, who's going to witness what you're saying to the truth of it? So the Prophet sallallahu just said, هذه الشجرة. This tree here. What kind of conviction he has to say just this tree here. It was on the side of the valley. So the Prophet called it up. It's not like we have, any, we have to go there. This is proper VIP service. Come over here. He says, no, he actually told the Arabi, you tell it to come and it'll come to you. Now this Arabi is probably amazed and dazed. So he called it and it came to him 
just tearing through the ground until he went, came and stood right in front of him and he said it three times that this is the messenger of Allah and then he went back done, it, done its job and went back Buraida radiallahu anhu reports that an A'rabi asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam for a sign for a, something special he says say to that tree that the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah is calling you. So that tree started to sway left and right and then started moving forward. And it started to tear the ground and come towards until it came and stood right in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Assalamu alaik, Ya Rasulullah. The Arabi said, tell it to go back now something weird you know like did I really see that okay now tell it to go back Murha ila manbitiha. so he went back apparently it was pulling all of its roots with it so it wasn't like just the top of the tree came its roots must have come out and it came came through and this is not a cartoon because when we hear these stories you go back to things you've seen like that this is human behavior we go back and we think how do we envisage that <coughs> So it's not this kind of refined way of the cartoons, you know, and, and so on. This is, this is something serious. Anyway, this Arabi then said to the Prophet Sallallahu I need to prostrate in front of you. So then the Prophet Sallallahu said, if I was going to tell anybody to prostrate, I would have tell, told a woman to prostrate for her husband. Okay, let me kiss your hands and your feet. So he let him kiss his hands. There's a number of other stories like that. So anyway, the, the poet, he then carries on. He says that the way it walked made these uh, these paths these lines on the ground so it didn't hover it actually came making lines and these symbols on the ground and that's why he says that it, it, it was as though their branches were writing lines as they came along with the finest calligraphy so in here it talks about its branches so it left its signs on the ground like nice calligraphy about what had just happened. Okay, then he's going to speak about other, po other miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In the next one he says, مِثْلَ الْغَمَامَةِ أَنَّا سَارَ سَائِرَةً تَقِيهِ حَرَّ وَطِيسٍ لِلْحَجِيرِ حَمِي Which is saying, and like the cloud, how it moved about to protect him from the midday heat, red hot. So that was another one. Then another one he says, Aqsamtu bil qamaril munshaqqi inna lahu min qalbihi nisbatan mabrurat al qasami. By the moon split in twain. Truly it has, I swear by an oath that is true, a link with his heart. So there's some nice poems. Aisha al Ba'uniya says, The Prophet King has come now, the banisher of shades. Illusion now is fled away, its recollection even fades, even fades. Now it's the time of the Prophet King. Mahmud Kaya, he says, a fish and then a sea, with Jonah's praise within. God uttered this degree, yield up what you drew in. So that's addressing the whale. Sulaiman Shalabi says, every atom in the world took up the tail cried they all with voices high uplifting hail so this is in refer reference to the trees and so on that were speaking about Prophet Amin al zuwaita says the starry stillness the courtyard of orange trees the unceasing signs of his calligraphy Allah's calligraphy you know there are people who have become Muslim from atheism just by looking at different fruits their textures their appearance their taste their shapes it's amazing just take for example just take an avocado take an orange take a grapefruit you seen how good a grapefruit tastes when you take out its when it's without it's when you take off the skin and you just eat the the flesh inside it's it's amazing the way allah has made it with the so sophisticated with all those lines 
go to one halal place, inshallah, to go and visit, right? Is t- go and take your kids to Kew Gardens. We've got these gardens in London. It costs 15 pound an adult and children are free. A few hundred years old and it's got trees and plants from all around the world. Thousands of species, everything, you know, from an olive tree to, to everything else, right? Trees from the tropics, trees from the deserts, trees from lilies, everything. Amazing just the fact that you've got literally thousands of types of different, different trees with colors and amazing. There's no way you cannot believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does it become like that? Because everything is so precisely designed. So precisely designed each one of these things. May Allah give us the tawfiq to recognize him. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ti adal jalali wa ikram. اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جزا الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم أو الله we ask we ask you to forgive our sins we ask you to allow us to become closer to you أو الله we ask that you illuminate our hearts O oh Allah, we ask that you illuminate our heart and you purify our heart. O oh Allah, our hearts are so impure. How can they enter into your pure court? O oh Allah, even in this world when a person is in a seminally defiled state and when he is impure, he is not allowed in the masjid. O oh Allah, he is not allowed to touch your book, the Quran. O oh Allah, if our hearts are so dirty and so impure with the years and years of sin, then how are you going to allow us to be in your court and to be close to you? Oh Allah, we ask that you purify our hearts despite our, despite our disobedience. We ask that you give us love for you and for your obedience to such a degree that we enjoy and we find the sweetness of faith and iman in our hearts. Oh Allah, we ask that you forgive us our sins and you forgive us our wrongdoings for the years and years of wrongdoings that we have. Oh Allah, oh Allah, we ask that instead of us wanting to impress others that we want to impress you. O oh Allah, allow us to constantly be thinking about you, that we want to impress you. Today is a Friday, and this is a time of acceptance. There's a time on this day, as your Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us, where du'as are accepted. O oh Allah, make this that time, that this is the time for acceptance and accept our du'a. Accept our du'a so that we be close to you and we find that the best of our, uh, our days is the day that we stand in front of you. O oh Allah, make us worthy of being in Jannatul Firdaus. Treat us with your mercy. Treat us with your mercy. O oh Allah, treat us with your mercy. O oh Allah, we ask that your mercy which is, which is available. But O oh Allah, we are bereft of it because we don't even ask for it. O oh Allah, we ask that you envelope us with your mercy and you deal with us with softness, with gentleness, with compassion. O oh Allah, we, we, if you deal with us and you exhaustively question us, then we don't see any form of survival. O oh Allah, we ask that you, you find one good action of us. There must be one thing that we have done in a moment of sincerity, in a moment of virtue, that, that is for you. O oh Allah, we ask that you turn all of our actions into valuable actions, despite our weakness and despite our de- defects. O oh Allah, O oh Allah. We ask you because there's nobody else to ask you. We ask that you protect us and our children. You accept all of those who've worshipped in this blessed night that has just passed. You <coughs> give us the tawfiq to allow us ourselves to be free to benefit from the month of Ramadan when it comes and to be better at the end of this next month of Ramadan than we were ever in our life. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, make us tomorrow better than we were ever in our life. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, we ask that you make us better every day that is remaining of this life so that when we are with you, we're not in a bad state. O oh Allah, safeguard us from a strange type of death and a sudden death. Allow us to be prepared for our death. O oh Allah, grant us your kalima, uh, kalima la ilaha illallah on our deathbed. And we ask that you bless your messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam abundantly, abundantly until, until eternity for all the good that he has done for us and grant us his company in the hereafter. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously.
to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.